Welcome back to the next lecture, everybody. In this one, we are going to touch on gestational diabetes. Let's start by discussing some of the risk factors for gestational diabetes. So if the patient has a history of gestational diabetes in prior pregnancies, this is going to place them at an elevated risk for gestational diabetes in subsequent pregnancies. If the patient has a family history of diabetes, especially in a first degree relative, that would be a risk factor. If the patient prior to pregnancy had a BMI over 30, or if they have excessive weight gain during the gestational time frame of 18 to 24 weeks, that would also put them at an increased risk. Now, certain medical conditions like impaired glucose tolerance, prediabetes with a hemoglobin A1C between 5.7 and 6.4, or if the patient has known PCOS, all these conditions put a patient at an elevated risk. Um, Two additional risk factors you just want to keep in mind if they give it to you in a vignette are advanced maternal age and non-Caucasian ethnicity. Those are also risk factors. Now, screening for gestational diabetes is performed between 24 and 28 weeks. The first step in screening involves a one-hour 50-gram oral glucose tolerance test. For this test, there is no need to fast. The patient is given 50, given 50 grams of oral glucose, and then one hour later, the serum glucose concentration is measured. Now, the most, cutoff, the most common cutoff in a positive screening will be when the patient's glucose concentration is greater than or equal to 140. However, some institutions of physicians will lower that threshold a bit to 135 or even 130. Now, especially if the patient has a lot of risk factors, that will be the case. Okay, With the understanding that more false positives are actually going to be present. However, if there's risk factors, they want to be more careful. Now, if the patient's below this threshold, no further testing would be needed. Now, if the patient does screen positive on the one hour 50 gram oral glucose tolerance test, the next step is going to be the three hour 100 gram oral glucose tolerance test. So the way this works is a hundred gram oral glucose load is given in the morning to a patient who has fasted overnight, or if not in the morning, then the patient must have fasted for at least eight hours. A positive test would generally be defined as two or more abnormally high glucose values at either the fasting, one hour, two hour, or three hour time points. Now the next slide has some more, um, has a normal cutoff. So let's take a look at that. So there are two different groups with slightly different cutoff points. Now using the Carpenter and Kustan criteria, it's going to increase the number of women diagnosed with gestational diabetes. But the data hasn't panned out with whether treating these milder cases of gestational diabetes will actually improve an outcome. So for now, both the more stringent Carpenter and Kustan criteria and less stringent national diabetes data group values are used. Again, if a patient has two or more abnormalities at the fasting one hour, two hour, or three hour time points, they're diagnosed with gestational diabetes. Now, after a patient receives a diagnosis of gestational diabetes, daily monitoring is performed to ensure that glucose targets are being achieved. Now, patients with gestational diabetes should self-monitor blood glucose levels, both fasting, i.e. before breakfast, and at either one or two hours postprandial. Fasting glucose should be less than 95 milligrams per deciliter. One hour postprandial glucose concentration should be less than 140, and two hour postprandial glucose concentration should be less than 120. Now, in addition to glucose monitoring, all patients should have a third trimester ultrasound performed at 36 to 39 weeks to assess for macrosomia. And this is, of course, for gestational patients, gestational diabetes patients. And if that estimated fetal weight is greater than or equal to 4,500 4, grams, indicating fetal macrosomia, then a C-section delivery is scheduled to prevent complications associated with macrosomia. Now, if the patient has good control of the gestational diabetes, either with dietary or dietary and pharmacologic treatment, and there's no evidence of macrosomia on ultrasound, then patients can be offered induction as early as 39 weeks of gestation, with induction recommended at the latest at 41 weeks gestation. Now, in terms of treatment for gestational diabetes, the first line is going to, to be medical nutritional counseling, with up to 85% of patients who being able to hit their target glucose with lifestyle modifications without the need for medication at all, which is fantastic because we want to avoid medications if we can in this time frame. Now, moderate exercise should be encouraged for patients without contraindications. Now, if medical nutritional counseling alone fails, insulin is your first-line pharmacotherapy with dosages being adjusted to meet the monitoring targets. If patients are non-compliant or they simply refuse to use insulin, then we can use metformin in their place. All right, that was a short one. Let's do some content review questions. Here is your first question. I'll put 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button.
correct answer here is B. Next question, 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, you know what to do. The correct answer here is D. And our final question, I will put 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got the answer, come on back. The correct answer here is B. All right, that is the end of our gestational diabetes mellitus lecture. I will see you guys on the next one.